Good evening, and welcome to our virtual event, Redistricting 101. As you just heard, this program is being recorded. I am Suzanne Brock, the current president of the League of Women Voters of the Cape Cod area. For 101 years, the League of Women Voters has been a nonpartisan, activist, grassroots organization for women and men whose core mission is empowering voters and defending democracy. To that end, we encourage informed and active participation in government, work to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influence public policy through education and advocacy. This evening's event is part of our ongoing voter education effort to help citizens understand the redistricting process. Article one, section two of the United States Constitution directs Congress to enumerate or count the number of residents every 10 years in order to apportion representatives among the states. In order to accomplish this, the census takes place and those numbers are used to direct any changes that need to be made in order to determine representative districts based on population numbers. This process is called redistricting. In this latest 10 year cycle of the census, Massachusetts has been able to retain all nine con congressional districts. <clears throat> Unlike 2010, when we lost one congressional seat due to the population decrease. Barnstable County is in Congressional District 9, Congressman William Keating's district. The redistricting process allows for our census numbers to work for us to ensure fair representation, to improve the impact of the voters' voice, and to ensure that every vote truly does count. In the past, some states have used redistricting to create preferred boundaries for political power. It was a time when representatives chose their voters rather than voters choosing their representatives. Legislators need to serve their constituents and focus on their district. A difficulty may arise if a district is split between two or more representatives. For example, at the present time, the town of Barnstable is served by three <clears throat> state house representatives. Because of this, the voice of some groups may be weakened or voting power may be complicated by conflicting interests between multiple districts within one town. It is important for voters to watch, to participate, and to comment on redistricting to make sure the process is transparent and that communities have input into who their representatives are and how and where they can vote. Redistricting empowers your vote and can be critical to issues that are important to you, such as school systems, transportation, healthcare delivery, affordable housing, immigration, economic inequality, hesitancy regarding improving our water quality through sewer expansions, and issues surrounding the fishing industry. With that brief introduction to the topic, I would like to point out to the audience that they may use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for our panelists. Questions will be addressed after all the presentations are given. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Beth Wong. Beth is the executive director at the Massachusetts Voter Table and works with over 25 community organizations to increase voter turnout, 
and civic leadership in communities of color and working class people in Massachusetts. As the director of Massachusetts Voters Table, Beth serves as the steering committee, on the steering committee, excuse me, of Raise Up Massachusetts and the Election Moder Modernization Coalition and convenes the Drawing Democracy Coalition, the Grassroots Redistricting Coalition. Prior to joining Massachusetts Voters Table as the field coordinator in 2016, Beth worked at Jobs with Justice as the national coordinator of the Student Labor Action Project. Beth is a senior trainer with the Midwest Academy. Welcome, Beth. Thanks, Suzanne. It's so nice to be with everyone here today. Uh, I wish I could visit you in person on the Cape instead of uh, virtually zooming in. Uh, it sounds like a, it seems like a great place to be right now. Um, so uh, thanks so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, we are proud members of the Drawing Democracy Coalition with the League of Women Voters. Uh, you all are a core partner um, in ensuring that we have a transparent and fair redistricting process. And we're going to dig into what some of those concepts are. We're going to look at the current uh, district maps, uh, and then uh, we can, and then I'll share a bit about what it is like to testify at one of the redistricting committee hearings. Uh, so, if we're ready to jump in, uh, let's get started about uh, how we define representation through fair redistricting. Uh, so, uh, Suzanne uh, gave a brief uh, uh, and succinct uh, uh, summary of what redistricting is and why it matters. Uh, I know that so many members of the League of Women Voters uh, helped us uh, phone bank to get out the count in the 2020 census. Uh, one of your, form I think one of your now former co-presidents, Judy Zonbrecher, helped lead so many of the phone banks uh, to uh, residents of low response uh, census tracts. And we really couldn't have gotten the work done without the League. You all made over 12,000 phone calls uh, to residents of hard to count uh, census tracts and were able to then get thousands of people to fill out the census because of your hard work. And so from the 2020 census, uh, we will see uh, new population data for where people now live in Massachusetts. Uh, the first uh, round of census data called apportionment data came out uh, earlier this year and showed that Massachusetts has 7 million in 7 million people and change. Uh, we are keeping all nine members of, or we are keeping nine congressional districts and we're not losing any seats in Congress. I believe uh, New York State, uh, if New York State had counted uh, a really small number of people, I think it's under a hundred people, uh, they would have preserved their number of members of Congress, but because they missed the target by about a hundred people, they actually are losing an entire member of Congress uh, from New York State. Uh, so luckily enough, we were able to keep all nine of our members of Congress or all nine congressional districts. And so uh, now, so since we got that first round of census data, we will receive another round of census data that is really granular. So we only have state level data right now, but on August 16th, which is coming up in only three weeks, uh, we will get a release of data for every census tract in the country. So that means uh, your direct um, your direct neighborhood. You'll be able to be able to see how many people live in your in your uh, census blocks, uh, and importantly, then how many people live in uh, the precincts in your neighborhood. So now, so given that population is increasing in some places and decrease and decreasing in others. Uh, we need to make sure that each district has about the same number of people in it. Um, so redistricting is the process of redrawing those electoral district boundaries based off of the changes in, uh, in population in the past 10 years. Uh, so uh, we'll, we will see what the differences are between uh, the 2020 census and the 2010 census, and we will balance out uh, the, the changes in population so that every district is, uh, has the same population. This is critically important because our representative democracy is based off of the principle one person, one vote. 
Uh, so redistricting is the process to ensure that everyone has, a, has an equal say in our political process. Um, and that's why redistricting is so important. Um, and if we want to drill down um, just one layer further, uh, redistricting impacts representation. Uh, how district lines are drawn influences who runs for office and who's elected. When people, when uh, people in a minority group uh, believe that they wouldn't have a uh, a fair shot of getting elected, uh, that means that people in that minority group are less likely to run for office. And if they're less likely to run for office, they probably don't have the role models that then encourage new people to run for office. And so we wind up in this uh, cycle of underrepresentation. Uh, redistricting is one. Uh, but not the only way uh, to increase representation of, of, ever, of uh, underrepresented groups in our commonwealth. Uh, and so that's one of the major reasons why we look at lots of different types of data um, when we redraw the lines. Uh, so, uh, or when I, I should say, when the state legislature redraws the lines and uh, we are going to be uh, influencing uh, how those lines are drawn by working with uh, with citizen with uh, residents and uh, committed citizens just like you uh, to weigh in on those maps. Uh, so I wanted to share two overall concepts uh, behind redistricting. The first is one person, one vote. Uh, this is uh, based on the Equal Protection Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. This is. Uh, something that uh, the civil rights movement fought for. Uh, this, is, uh, this is part of evening out the district sizes um, after the decennial census happens every 10 years. Uh, one important piece um, is um, the maps need to respect the Voting Rights Act. Uh, the Voting Rights Act is that uh, historic piece of legislation passed in uh, 1965 that prevents uh, discrimination in our political process. Uh, minority vote dilution is the main way that uh, that uh, gerrymandering can uh, uh, that gerrymandering uh, can make maps illegal or you can sue over the maps. Uh, minority vote dilution happens when um, districts are drawn to decrease the chance of minority voters to elect candidates of their choice. Uh, and so I'll show you two ways um, that, that minority vote dilution typically shows up. Um, but first, I'll share, I'll share with you a very simplified version uh, of a fair map. So here we see that there are six turquoise dots, and we see that there are six burgundy dots. So um, since we have half of the dots are turquoise, half of them are burgundy, we would expect that two, two out of four districts or half of the districts would be majority turquoise and half of the districts would be majority burgundy. So here we see that. So we see two majority turquoise districts and you see two majority burgundy districts. So this is what we would consider a fair map because uh, the proportion of districts is the same as the proportion of the dots or the proportion of the population. So let's take a look at what minority vote dilution looks like. So the first example is cracking. So this means spreading minority voters into small enough portions that they are not a majority anywhere. So we'll see, we see here in these top three rows that we have cracked these red dots um, by making these, these three districts that are two to one turquoise to burgundy. So we see that the burgundy dots are only one out of three of the dots in each one of these districts. The second way that minority vote dilution shows up is through packing. This means putting as many minority districts into a single district when they actually could control more. So if you remember our, our old map, it, we had two turquoise districts, we had two burgundy districts. Here, we wind up with three turquoise districts and only one burgundy district. Uh, so that's how uh, cracking and packing uh, typically shows up is uh, through uh, these two means, and they often go hand in hand. So you can uh, concentrate minority voters in one 
uh, in one area, and then you can, uh, and then uh, uh, dilute the power of all of the surrounding uh, minority voters. So both of these, cracking and packing, um, are illegal. In fact, um, Tom Finneran, who is a former Speaker of the House, uh, so uh, the Speaker before, so I think three Speakers ago, um, actually uh, lost his Speakership and was indicted on federal perjury charges after lying that he had no knowledge of a packing scheme of Black voters in Mattapan. Uh, and so it, uh, minority vote dilution and gerrymandering have happened um, in Massachusetts with real consequences uh, for even, um, uh, even politicians with the most power in the entire state. Um, that's how serious minority vote dilution is, um, is that uh, if someone lies about not knowing about minority vote dilution, uh, that person can lose uh, their position and even wind up in uh, federal prison. So um, this is all, so we've gone through what we can't do. So let's go through um, how you can have a positive role in redistricting. Um, and so the first major piece is to define your community of interest or your neighborhood. Um, these are people who, uh, so who are the groups of people who have a common concern uh, who would benefit from being in a single district? Um, you all can think of times that Maybe you're at a restaurant and um, you have two, you have two or more wait staff, um, none of whom is particularly attentive to you. Um, now imagine that you have one one server who is really attentive to you and isn't and uh, is uh, constantly checking in on your table. Which one would you prefer? Would you uh, prefer a group of three less attentive wait staff, or would you have would you rather have one more attentive wait staff? Um, I'm guessing you probably want one more attentive wait staff, and that's why uh, you need to define your table or your community of interest. Um, so these are people who uh, maybe it's people who all all. Uh, live along the coast and work in the fishing industry. Maybe it's a place um, where most people um, work in the tourism industry um, and want the fishing industry uh, interests or tourism interests to be represented well on Beacon Hill or in Congress. So you can think of communities of interest as people who have similar concerns and want that really attentive uh, elected official representing their interests 365 days a year. Uh, so what, what is really important about communities of interest is that you define your local community of interest. It's not coming from, from uh, Boston-based groups. It's not coming from DC-based groups. It's coming from you and your neighbors defining uh, what are the common policy concerns uh, and the geographic area uh, of people who have those common policy concerns. Uh, we use two types of information for defining communities of interest. The first are stories. What are the things that connect people? Why is it important that um, you and your neighbors are kept together? Uh, what is different between you and your neighbors and people close to you? Um, so, so that's the first piece are stories. The next piece is data. Um, so you want to describe what people have in common um, are there similar educational attainment rates? Um, are there similar income levels? Do people work um, in similar industries? Um, what are some things that people have in, um, is there a similar linguistic, uh, a common language that's spoken? Something to keep in mind is that race and ethnicity can be one factor, but it can't be the only reason behind a community of interest. Um, however, we can think of all the things that um, people of a similar ethnic group might have in common. Maybe it's a sim similar cultural heritage, a similar language that's spoken. Um, uh, I think of the um, of how the Haitian community um, in Boston fought to keep a dual uh, Haitian English language school open. Um, that's a community of interest of parents and of parents and students who go to that school. So even though race and ethnicity um, can, cannot be the only factor, Sometimes there are community needs like main streets with immigrant businesses, 
uh, a dual language school that might be um, adjacent to ethnicity, but is not ethnicity itself. Uh, and just another reminder, it's not me defining the community of interest. It's not someone in DC or Boston defining the community of interest. You are the person, you are the people who will define the communities of interest on the Cape. Um, a few other questions for telling your community story include, um, how has the population changed in the past 10 years? Um, if any of you um, um, are part of the school system, um, how does the uh, population of the schools differ from the population in the rest of the community? That usually shows where the, where the population of your community might be going. Um, what kinds of things do people do for a living? Do you have uh, cultural traditions or celebrations? Are there places where people gather? Is there a largest employer? Um, what's the history of how your community came together? Another major thing that uh, we, another major strategy in addition to defining communities of interest to increase representation are drawing majority minority districts. These are protected uh, by the Voting Rights Act and uh, contain a majority of a, of a single racial or linguistic minority group. Um, in 2011, the Drawing Democracy Coalition drew the first majority minority uh, congressional district, Congressional District 7, which includes uh, many parts of Boston. And in 2018, um, Ayanna Presley was elected the first black uh, member of Congress from, uh, from Massachusetts, from that majority minority uh, district. Uh, we also can draw coalition districts, which um, our combined racial minorities make up more than 50% um, of the citizen voting age population or the eligible voter population. <clears throat> We also can draw influence districts in which um, a racial or ethnic minority group doesn't make up a majority of voters, but does have substantial sway um, as a voting block um, for any elected official who represents that district. Uh, and in 2011, the uh, Drawing Democracy Coalition recommended and then won uh, 20 majority minority districts across the state. Uh, most of them are in and around Boston or the gateway cities. Uh, and so we have a couple strategies uh, for you uh, to get involved in winning fair maps. Um, the first is to submit um, a community of interest map using representable, which I will make sure to show you in a moment. Uh, and the second is to uh, create a statewide unity map um, you can imagine that if we are divided over how a specific district works or a specific district looks, uh, looks like, um, then whoever's the incumbent um, for that district can say, well, because let's say Suzanne uh, and Beth are divided on what we want a district to look like, then I can draw whatever district I want, right? So, uh, Redistricting is truly one of the most zero sum things that I've ever worked on. It's kind of like squeezing a balloon. Uh, if you squeeze the air on one side, the air goes to the other side of the balloon. Uh, similarly, if you move around some precincts or wards of one district, uh, you need to, uh, and you remove some precincts or wards from one district, you need to add precincts or wards from another district. So it's a little bit like a uh, squeezing a balloon. Another way to think about it is like a domino effect. If you uh, change one district, then you've got to change the neighboring districts, which they all, and then you have this domino effect of having to change all of the districts. Um, and so a few asks to you. Um, and so you're doing the first piece right now. You have now recruited and organized people in your area um, with shared experiences, concerns, uh, and vision. Uh, I think everyone here wants to increase representation and civic engagement on the Cape. Uh, the second is to share your story about what matters to you at hearings. So there's one coming up on Thursday um, in the media. I saw that great op-ed. I forget in which paper from the League of Women Voters from Cape Cod um, a few weeks ago. Um, and then we are going to start drawing um, um, district maps starting in mid to late August when we get the data. We certainly want to come back to all of you to share with you um, what our proposal is uh, for uh, districts on the Cape, 
get your feedback um, and make sure that your feedback is incorporated into a statewide unity map. Uh, so that's um, how you can be involved. And so I wanted to share with you um, a few a few more resources. Um, this is one of my favorite websites. It's called Dave's Redistricting. Um, and I'll make sure to um, send along all of these materials, but I'll also put it into the chat. Um, it's the best way I think of viewing the, uh, in a very interactive way of viewing all of the current districts. And so here you'll see um, what the current districts are um, for the congressional map. And that hearing that's coming up on Thursday, you, um, you can talk about um, the congressional districts, the governor's council districts, the state senate districts, and also the state representative districts. Those are all in play. Uh, and so definitely feel free to talk about, uh, air your grievances if you have any um, with any of the, uh, on how any of those districts are shaped at the state rep, state senate, governor's council, or congressional level. Um, so we see all of the CAPE is in District 9. That's probably good for the CAPE, right? You have uh, hopefully one, uh, you have a very attentive uh, member of Congress who knows that most of his voters uh, or a large share of his voters are uh, living on the CAPE and uh, will take into uh, consideration your concerns um, and, uh, and needs. So it seems uh, very unlikely uh, it seems nearly impossible that uh, the CAPE is going to get split up in, uh, in a congressional district. There's just kind of no good way to do it. Um, so I anticipate that uh, if you live on the CAPE, um, you will still wind up being grouped together no matter what. Um, the same is, is mostly true um, of, um, of the state Senate. So uh, just as some background, um, congressional districts are about, uh, the ideal district size is close to 800,000. It's uh, 700,000 and I think it's 780,000 uh, people. Um, a, state, a state Senate district um, is, is about 170,000 people in change. Um, so you, uh, as you can see, um, I think, Julian Sear represents the vast majority of the Cape. Um, and then is that Sue Morant? I can't remember who represents this part. Um, but, uh, and then uh, another state Senator has um, a slice of the Cape um, along, with, uh, along with Plymouth. Um, if there are major changes that you want to see um, with any of these districts, uh, this is the time to voice them. Uh, so this, um, this district that is mostly the Cape um, is almost exactly the right size. It's about 500 people short. Um, but this district um, that includes the Cape, but also Plymouth, um, is about 8,000 people short. So, you will, so whoever is this representative will need to pick up about 8,000 people um, in, another, in another town. Um, it does seem like the state Senate wants to keep as many towns whole in, in the district maps. Um, so I think if, you, if your community is split, um, although I don't quite think that's true for any of the state Senate districts, um, you might wanna make a case on Thursday um, why your, your town should stay whole. But I think in the, on the state Senate side, almost every community on the Cape is whole. So I don't think that's a huge problem. Um, and then finally, let's, act, let's take a look at the state representative districts. Um, so we do see that Barnstable um, is split between uh, three uh, state representatives. Um, many times when there are three state representatives, uh, you wind up with three very attentive uh, state reps. Sometimes when you, when you have three state reps, you wind up with three very not attentive state reps, or maybe just one very attentive state representative. Um, if you do have um, comments about uh, how, how to redraw these districts such that um, people in Barnstable or really any community that is um, split between uh, more than one district um, is shaped, 
um, Wednesday, uh, sorry, Thursday's hearing is the best time to do this. Um, so again, you, you don't need to get into the super nitty gritty um, of exactly which precincts to move around. But I think if you if your community is split up um, and you want your community, you want your district to be reshaped, Thursday is the is one of the best times to voice those concerns. Uh, and so if you uh, want to move um, this Barnstable dis district, um, or if you want to move this um, Barnstable district into the same um, the same district as this as this Barnstable district, and you want to move around these precincts, being in Yarmouth, uh, this would be an important time to voice those concerns. Uh, if you think it's actually a good thing that uh, Yarmouth is served by two state reps and Barnstable is served by two state reps, that is also a valid. Uh, that is also valid, and uh, uh, you can share that as well. Um, so those are some. Uh, potential testimonies that you could give. Um, and I think, I'm not entirely sure which other municipalities are split up. Um, it looks like Brewster is as well. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I think that there's nothing better to prepare for testimony than to look at these maps uh, and see uh, how your, how the district that you live in is shaped. Um, that is, I think, the best preparation that you can do um, to speak really powerfully to what types of changes you want to see in your representation. Um, and then finally, I wanted to share with everyone um, these talking points and tips uh, for, uh, for co these congressional district hearings, um, sharing what your community of interest is. So uh, what defines your community? How is it different from from the adjacent communities um, is one of the most important pieces. Um, you'll see a lot of these talking points. Um, if you work in a nonprofit organization, sharing how your client base has changed in the past 10 years. Um, do you now see people of Brazilian in the Brazilian community when you didn't see so many uh, people from the Brazilian community 10 years ago? Are more people speaking? Do you see more people speaking? Uh, speaking um, uh, speaking Spanish than you did 10 years ago or fewer. Those are all really useful pieces of information that only you actually have. Um, so uh, there is really, uh, you are the expert of your own experience and of your own community. Uh, even people who don't think that they, even people who say, oh, I don't actually know what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, if you have thought about how your community has changed in the past 10 years, you are qualified to testify at these redistricting hearings, uh, talking about even the really small changes um, uh, in your community in the past 10 years is really helpful information uh, for the redistricting committee and uh, as they consider how to redraw these maps. Um, and then find the last last thing that I'll show you um, is how to uh, how to submit a community of interest. Um, so this is a tool called Representable. Um, and uh, you can answer all of these questions about uh, what your community of interest is. Um, and then you can name your community and uh, then draw uh, then draw your community. Uh, so we can then click um, click around uh, to submit, to submit a map to the Drawing to Democracy Coalition. Uh, we will use uh, these community of interest maps as the building blocks uh, for keeping uh, for our district maps. Um, so uh, as you take a look at the maps, uh, please do submit a community of interest um, for your community on the Cape. Uh, we will try as hard as possible to keep um, as many of these communities of interest whole as we draw district maps. Um, so those are three things that you can do um, to get involved in the redistricting process. The first is just take a look at the current districts. Um, the second is sign up for the hearing um, on Thursday uh, and share how your community has changed in the past 10 years. Um, and then finally, um, share with the Drawing Democracy Coalition uh, what your community looks like on a map um, and what are some of the community needs. 
uh, we will use those as the building blocks um, as we draw district maps. Um, so that's that's the presentation for today. Uh, really, thanks so much uh, for uh, inviting me and giving me uh, time to speak. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Beth. That was great. And hopefully um, a lot of our audience will be able to use all of your suggestions so that we can make this redistricting process work for us. And now we're going to hear from Ann Quirk. Ann is the current town clerk for Barnstable. She has previous experience having served as the town clerk in Yarmouth and the assistant town clerk for Barnstable for several years before being elected. She has served the town of Barnstable for eight years. Anne runs all municipal and federal elections, issues certificates and licenses, keeps official municipal records, and provides information to set town residents and town de uh, departments. Welcome, Anne. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I'm going to go backwards, if you don't mind, and I'm going to start with the local census. Um, we are mandated, all town clerks in Massachusetts are mandated to have a yearly census. We all try to get this out between the very first few weeks of January to all of our residents so that we can have a really good picture of our demographics. Part of the reason is to make sure that we know how many children are gonna show up for school. We wanna make sure we have all those facilities for those children. We wanna know how many people we have in an aging population. Are we providing for the aging population? We want to know that we have the resources for all groups of people. We also want to know when someone goes into the military and then they return home, Massachusetts gives them a return home bonus. The only way we can determine this is to know whether or not they were on the census. And that's because you no longer have your lists of students in the, in the annual reports because children under the age of 17, you can't have them in there. So these are the kinds of things that we use to help take care of the, the residents of the town of Barnstable or any town in city in Massachusetts. Also, in many cases now, college students have to show residency in order to receive a reduced rate for their colleges. Again, that comes from the census. It all comes from the census. So we are mandated to send this out. We send it out every year and we talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. So you'll all send it back to us. The, the other piece to this is it also makes my voter list correct. So if you don't return it, or if I don't receive it, I, I, no one has control over the mail. Once it goes out, they do a great job, but things get lost. If, um, if I don't get it back, or if it gets lost in the mail, or whatever happens to it, I am required by a state statute to make you inactive as a voter. It doesn't take you off the voter list, just puts a big I next to your name. So when you go in to vote, you have to prove where you live. It's easily done. It's a license. It's a, an electric bill with your name and address on it. It's your renter's bill with your name and address on it. It's, it's whatever you can show us that indicates, yes, I in fact still live in this location so that you can go ahead and vote. We're trying to protect your vote all the way around. So uh, we don't just 
pull you off the voter list and we would never do that. We have, we have to follow federal and state law on that. So we do make you inactive, but we will make, make sure you have your right to vote in case we don't uh, have that information. The other thing you should always know is you can always call us. If you ever have a feeling that, gee, I wonder if they got that back or if there's any problem, call us. We'll, we'll tell you right over the phone. Yep, you're here, you're fine, no problem. Now, that takes into consideration our yearly census. And then every 10 years, we have the federal census as Beth was referring to. And the federal government gets involved to the point where they'll actually go door to door, which we of course cannot afford to do. So every year, every 10 years, this happens, except in 2019-20 area where we had COVID. It was a little hard for everybody to go out to every residence. So some of that, they tried really hard to do it, but you can't actually go to every single house when we have a pandemic. It's just not gonna happen. So we have been given figures through the Secretary of State's office. And they came to us from the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. And they did their own um, population information for us. They did estimates. Now, I'm not quite sure how they did the whole thing, but they gave us estimates of what our population is because we have not seen the 2020 numbers yet. And this is very important to me because as I look at the numbers from 10 years ago to 2020, I've lost 695 residents in the town of Barnstable, according to those numbers. However, as of today, I have 35,540 voters, which is more than we had during the presidential election. So there's this discrepancy here. I, I'm, you know, I'm a little leery of, of the numbers because of that. Something doesn't add up, if you know what I mean. So now I'm looking at, okay, we're hoping that we'll get these numbers back. And um, if I could refer to one of the maps that was showing that was uh, Representative Tim, um, your area in Barnstable, um, it showed a blue area and then it showed actually the village of Barnstable was taken away from you. So I've had um, the maps in my office and I've invited all of our represent uh, all of my um, elected town councilors to come in and look at the maps because you know this is important you can't take away the village of Mar of Barnstable and put it into precinct 11 that's right across from the courthouse that's that's the village of Barnstable so we we had a conference call um, we got online with the Secretary of State's office and uh, we tried to get the numbers to move. And as Beth mentioned, as soon as you start moving numbers, you're moving them everywhere. So when I look at the preliminary map for the town of Barnstable, it's uh, a little convoluted in my, in my estimation. We did get Barnstable Village back into Barnstable Village into Precinct 1. Um, we have, as you know, we have three different districts. So I have three different ballot faces whenever we do an election. So for instance, right now, I know I'm down 695 people according to these preliminary numbers. I talked to Taylor White, who is the sandwich town clerk he's down 600 people. He would have, we, our, our precincts 11 and 12 
would be part of Steve Zaharo's representative area and then go into Sandwich. So he goes from, from Marston's Mills into Sandwich or Marston's Mills, part of Marston's Mills and part of West Barnesville goes into Sandwich. My concern is, and this is my concern, as because we haven't really got our precinct lines down yet. What if, what if they're gonna split another one of my precincts and push it towards Sandwich because Sandwich has lost numbers. So it could be, and this is really the major concern for all of us as town clerks, it could be that in one precinct, I could have two separate representative districts. That's why we do the precincts lines first before we do the state lines. It, I hope that makes sense to folks because that is a huge piece of what we're concerned about, all of us as town clerks. I talked to the Brewster town clerk. Um, her district has, has separated, the way they've done the lines right now in her town is they've put all the people that are on the wealthier side of town in one precinct and all of the others in another precinct. I have concern over, uh, after speaking with a couple of the town councilors, where, where one of my precincts has, is the same thing is happening. The wealthier part of town along the water is, has split off the precinct. So the other piece of it is going to Marston's Mills instead of Osterville or Ketuit or wherever. Um, those are concerns of ours as town clerks. We, we want to make sure we have a good mix of people in every single precinct because that's how it works. And um, we've talked to the Secretary of State's office. We've all been in touch with them. And they honestly feel that if we wait and we get all the numbers, which we should have by the end of September, we can then look at the maps, make sure we've drawn our precincts, and then it has to go to the LEDRC, which is the local election, uh, it goes on and on and on, and I can find it for you, but it, that's the group that will finally say, yes, those precincts are good precincts. The other piece of it is because we're, the precincts are switching around a lot, I'm going to have to come up with new polling places. So before we do all that, let's make sure that we have our precincts where we should have our precincts. And that's our major concern. And I don't see how we can do it until we get the actual numbers. So I, I um, that's where I stand on it. And I have talked to quite a few people and I'm, I'm certainly hoping that they all, um, do spend time on this because we're kind of going uh, we're kind of going around the barn here. We're we're doing this backwards. If we redistrict first before we do the precincts, and I hope that I've kind of explained everything because it's it's a lot. But I do know that Secretary Galvin feels that we will have enough time to get this all done so that there shouldn't be a problem for all of our representatives and all of our, our senators and they, that they will have time in order to run for office because it is coming up. We will have a preliminary in, in September timeframe and we will have uh, in 2022 and we will have an election in November 8th, I think it is 2022. But in the meantime, just so that everyone understands for the actual town election, which is coming up this November, you are, you are in the precincts you're in right now. That is not changing before the November election. So your um, town council seats that are up 
your housing authority seats that are coming up, your, your school committee seats, my job, all of those, we will still be in our precincts as we are today. That is not changing before the November 2021 election. Thank you, Ann. Are you, are you all set or do you have something else you'd like to share? I'm all set unless you have some questions for me. Well, okay. we might, so, so don't go away. I, I, I just wanted to tell you that I live in Dennis and I had a conversation with our town clerk yep. and she's really concerned about the precinct thing too, especially mm -hmm. since we have the um, historic divide yes. and so she has different ballots for those different precincts whether or not you're in the historic district or not so um good luck with your job is all i can say thank you i did talk with terry bunce as yeah. well and she's yeah. great and and you were lucky enough she really was lucky enough to be able to split that off and now yeah. we can't do that in barnstable just because it follows the line of the um uh, the old king's highway right it right. doesn't work for us unfortunately but i feel for her because that yeah. that's a big deal it is well thank you so much for um making those comments and don't go away because you might have some questions okay i'd like to um now move into the public um, engagement component of our evening the massachusetts state special joint committee on redistricting has been meeting since april hearing testimony from elected officials individual citizens, and representatives from many grassroots organizations. Some of these are Drawing Democracy, the NAACP, the Worcester Interface, the Massachusetts Alliance, the Labor Assembly of the United Auto Workers, Lawyers for Civil Rights, the Southeast Massachusetts Coalition for Social Justice, Massachusetts Voter Table, and many others. Throughout these hearings, it was reiterated that the districts must be contiguous and congruous, but also have included a plea from citizens to make those districts compact. There must be a compatibility with all citizens, majority and minority neighborhoods, immigrants and refugees, the disabled, blind and physically challenged, as well as the incarcerated. Both co-chairs, Senator William Brownsberger and Representative Michael Moran, have voiced their desire that this is an opportunity to make the disenfranchised included and engaged. As Beth Wong of Massachusetts Voter Table summed it up, this is a grassroots conversation we all eagerly anticipate the final census data. At this time, I would like to call on Barnstable Town Councilwoman and League of Women Voters of the Cape Cod area member, Debbie Dagwan, who will make a few comments on areas of importance for the residents of the town of Barnstable. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you. and. Um... I want to thank the uh, League of Women Voters and all of those who have volunteered to participate tonight in this particular uh, issue of, of importance um, as we look at uh, changes that are about to take place in our communities and throughout the state. And uh, tonight particularly focused on uh, the Cape area and we're looking at uh, Barnstable uh, in particular in uh, District uh, 9, which is going to have a very important meeting that's coming up, and or a hearing, shall I say. And uh, I just want to say, one, that I really appreciate um, the information that Ms. Hung gave tonight. Uh, thank you so much for sharing what you did with us in such a uh, easy and uh, understandable way for the common person to really you know, take in what, what you were saying and uh, what's uh, how they can participate. And of course, I always have to speak and admire my uh, town clerk from Barnstable uh, and Quirk, 
who I also feel always does a wonderful job um, uh, uh, educating uh, the public and uh, keeping us informed, and particularly those of us, uh, uh, myself, including who are counselors and uh, just, uh, you know, keeping us on our toes as to what we should be doing and, and uh, staying on target and on point. But um, as for the hearing that's coming up on the 29th, this hearing will provide an opportunity for area residents who will be affected by the redistricting districts and their uh, potentially new district locations and geographical um, lines, which will be drawn. It's given an opportunity for them to offer their opinions, uh, their concerns and interests and in which uh, redistricting will um, affect their community, but more specifically their neighborhoods. Um, and we're talking about the unique neighborhoods uh, such as uh, your, you know, your, your, your uh, ethnic neighborhoods, your low income, your fixed income neighborhoods, um, all of your population, your seniors, your youth. Um, it also will affect, um, as was uh, spoken by Mrs. Hong, um, your schools, housing. Uh, just so many things, the environmental issues, water quality issues, uh, well locations for, you know, uh, for future secure uh, locations for future well locations that will help um, uh, provide just, you know, and such important uh, issues that will affect your, your area in particular. Um, and you know, just the, the implementation of the 208 plan, the open space, recreational space, recreational uh, um, uh, opportunities, so I said, and access and opportunities as well as access for health, uh, healthcare and accessibility for um, social services, transportation, um, and we talk about housing, we're talking about variable housing um, interest and alternative housing. And, um, you know, the, the rate players and the interest of not only um, rate players, but, you know, our renters and the potential burdens that may affect our businesses, especially our small businesses would make up a lot of these towns and things in our area. Um, it's so important and um, job opportunities. So people really need to do exactly what um, Ms. Hong outlined. Uh, and she talked about, you know, look at the, um, the community of interest maps, uh, the maps in your area and um, sign up to testify and, and share, you know, how things have changed in your community and what interests you uh, the most and, um, you know, share, you know, the coalition district uh, data and concerns. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Debbie. That was great. And um, I'm sure that um, all of us will take your suggestions along with um, Ms. Wong's suggestions and uh, be on board on uh, Thursday night. I appreciate you participating. Thank you, and also wanted to, to recognize the representatives that are here tonight as well to, to join you. in. Thank you all. At this time, I would like to introduce those representatives. Um, Representative Timothy Whalen of the 1st Barnstable District, Representative Kip Diggs of the 2nd Barnstable District, and Representative Stephen Zaros of the 5th Barnstable District. Good evening, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. Thank you we for inviting two... myself and my colleagues. <laughs> we have two questions that we'd like to ask you that focus on how you approach representing the town of Barnstable. I will ask each question and you will all have a chance to answer. The first question is, what constituent services have been most requested and what issues have been raised by the voters in your district this past year? Do they vary from town to town? And let's start with um, Mr. Whalen. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak, Suzanne. And uh, it's always nice uh, 
coming in after my uh, uh, good friend, Councillor Dagwan, who does a lot of great work in the town of Barnstable, serving her constituents with uh, uh, vigor and zeal, without question. Uh, in answer to your question, Suzanne, um, I would say that over the past year, the constituent services have pivoted. Uh, prior to, in my, my previous three terms while I was serving, before COVID hit, uh, questions would come in, they were varied. Uh, needs would come in um, basically across the, the broad spectrum. Everything has been over the past year COVID related. Um, unemployment cases, uh, having to deal with pandemic unemployment, the uh, Department of Unemployment on behalf of constituents has, has been uh, probably uh, chief among them. Early on, it was trying to get access for constituents and for our communities to uh, uh, COVID testing. And then once January rolled around and the vaccines came about, it was all about vaccines and getting more vaccines to the Cape and getting as many people vaccinated as we possibly could. Uh, and lastly, I would say from the start to the finish, um, and even now still, it's uh, business assistance, uh, trying to help our hardworking small business people uh, so that they can, uh, so that they've been able to manage to get their way through this, uh, uh, this terrible pandemic. Thank you so much. Um, Representative Zaros. Thank you, everybody. Um, I echo what my brother rep, Tim Whalen says, and I also want to give a shout out to uh, Councillor Dagwan. What you said was perfectly stated. You covered all the angles. Uh, I think for me, it might be a little different because I'm brand new, you know, so rep Diggs and I, you know, I think it's a beautiful story where, you know, we've never run for office. We're friends. We have two different parties. We both lost a child. And, you know, we both ran for office and we won and we love it. So for me, it's new, but I have, as you probably know, you know, parts of Barnstable, all of Sandwich, parts of uh, Bourne, and even parts of Plymouth. But I, I think the concerns are very similar. So what Representative Whalen was saying, we deal with all the time. Um, and I think the common theme is we're all people trying to do good things. So we get along well, which uh, is important, you know, on the Cape, the delegation, we're friends and we try to do good things when it comes to Barnstable, you know, that's where I live. I live in West Barnstable, precinct 11, and, uh, I love it. Uh, so some of the things that we deal with, I, uh, you know, in addition to what, Rep. Whalen was saying, I wrote a list today because it's pretty interesting. I would say 90% of what your state rep does is um, constituent services. You know, obviously we make laws, we vote on, you know, $48 billion worth of state funds. It's huge. But we deal with unemployment. We deal with um, small business concerns. We deal with COVID. You deal with veteran benefits, housing water quality, wastewater, you know, those are all the same and throughout the district. What makes mine a little different, because I have sandwich and born, you know, we have the bridges. So, you know, those two bridges are going to be replaced. That's going to be a huge thing, huge, you know, a billion dollar project. Um, it'll affect all of us on the Cape. But if you live in Bourne and Sandwich, you go over those bridges, especially Bourne, like 10 times a day because your town is split. Now. But when it comes to specifically Barnstable, I work with my town counselor, uh, Chris Clark, Matt Levesque, you know, all the people in, in West Barnstable and Marston's Mills and uh, Madam Quirk, um, Madam Town Clerk Quirk. <laughs> She's right on as well because... You know, I'm in a split district or a precinct already. So Kip Diggs has half of Marston's Mills. I have the other half. And sometimes it's confusing on, you know, where does it end, you know, and stop. So we do our best to get along, work together, common goal, help people. Those are the things we deal with all the time. I want you to reach out. Uh, but the whole redistricting uh, to your you know, original point is huge. Okay. It's you. And Thank I'm you. here to help you and represent you. Thank you so, so much. Um, 
I would like to turn to Representative Kip Diggs now. Um, I know he was having trouble getting on. Um, Representative Diggs, are you there? I don't see him on the screen. I don't see him either. Um, well, you know what? I'm gonna go to the second question and hopefully he will get in and he can answer them. I'm answering, oh. Uh, Unmute. Representative Diggs, are you on? If uh, if you are, and you are you muted? I will text them in the meantime. Okay. See if I can All right. Okay. Um, the second question that we wanted to address was. Um, since the town of Barnstable is represented by three representatives who also represent adjoining towns, how do you resolve competing interests or conflicts of interest among the towns in your district? So, and if, so, if Representative Diggs is there, he can go first. And if not, we will let him jump in when he gets on. Um, so I think he was on as a, uh, a attendee, not as a panelist, but I was trying to promote him to panelist, but he seems to now have logged off completely. Oh, no. So if somebody can contact him and we can... Get him back in. Yeah. Okay. In the meantime, while um, Representative Zaros is trying to do that, uh, uh, Representative Whalen, why don't you go ahead and answer that question? Would you like me to repeat it? No, Suzanne, I, uh, I, I have it. Thank you very much. Sure. And that's a really that, that's a really good question. That's one I don't think I've ever been asked before, but uh, it's very uh, it's very applicable. Uh, I would say that uh, there are three things, three things that you, that uh, are, are the key to working successfully when you do have uh, you know competing interests when you have split towns. Uh, number one is communication. Uh, constant communication is is critically important. Number two is trust. You got to trust the people that you work with. And number three brings us right back to communication. Uh, there are competing interests. I split uh, Barnstable with uh, my good friends, Rep Diggs and uh, Rep Exaros. Um, I also split um, uh, the town of Brewster with um, Representative Peak, who's also a very dear and close friend of mine too. Uh, we also share constituencies as well with uh, our friend Julian Sear, Senator Sear uh, in the Senate. And um, what we do is we just kind of, uh, we have a really, really good thing going down here. Uh, with our delegation, the Cape and Islands delegation. We get recognized around the state um, for the fact that we work together in a very, um, you know, across party lines uh, in a nonpartisan manner. And again, I think that a lot of that comes down to uh, uh, communication and trust. I give an awful lot of credit uh, in that as well to uh, Representative Peak because uh, she is the dean of our delegation and uh, she does a really, really good job um, uh, leading our group as well as trying to get, um, like we have, you know, with the two new members that we had come in with uh, Rep Diggs and Rep Exaros, um, uh, bringing them in and um, just explaining to them the way that things work and how, um, you know, it doesn't matter uh, anything, nothing matters more than just doing the best that we can for our community here. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Representative Zaros, did you have any luck? I did text them and okay. uh, he says I'm on. He, he, he said oh. he's on. He's on. Okay. Well, let me okay. see if I if he's listening. Representative Diggs, are you there? You know, sometimes I just hate technology. <laughs> Great when it works, but when it doesn't, it's a real pain in the neck. Yeah. Okay, well, why don't you go ahead and um, respond and then I'll keep my fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, well, Rep Diggs and I are friends and we both have the same haircut, so I can speak <laughs> for him too. Uh, I would add that not only it's respect, you know, we're, we have, we're friends, you know, all of us. We all have bring kind of different passion. We all have kind of strengths in different areas, but, you know, we respect each other. And I guess that's not normal. <laughs> I've learned like in other parts of the state that, you know, it's more selfishness maybe, but here, you know, 
this is who we are. We're here for you. I love it. We're lucky to do it. It's a privilege. So I would just add that fact of respect, communication, like, like Tim said, um, and kind of realize how it all works. It's a big picture. Uh, right. So, you know, I'm the fifth Barnstable district and I'm going to fight for West Barnstable and half of Boston's mills. But there is a big picture, too. And, you know, it's important that you communicate so you can uh, be successful because we want Cape Cod to stay beautiful. And we need the water to be clean and we need to have wastewater management, all those things. And I, I think it comes down to communication, like Tim said trust each other and that respect for each other and the process and realize it's a big picture and Cape Cod is our priority. Thank you so, so much. Uh, Representative Diggs is on the phone. Jean? I had to unmute, sorry. That's all right. You have me? Yeah. Yeah, they can hear you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you. Um, what is the first question? I, I, so I jumped on. I'm not sure what question now you asked. So can you just refer me and I'll, I'll go. I can tell you that, you know, uh, Rep. Keats, Julian, Rep. Whalen, Rep. Xaros, we're all working together and we respect each other. And I think that's the first thing. But like I've told my constituents when I got, um, to this position. It's not about the DODR. It's about me respecting everybody's wishes and trying to work hard for everyone. And I'm trying to be everywhere I can because this is my home and I love my home. And when I, the reason why I ran is because of the love that I got when my son passed away. And that passion that I still have is for everyone else that's that's rooting for me and that's that voted for me. So that's really my whole premise is making sure that I'm representing all of my districts. Um, I just want to um, ask you quickly, um, the first question was, what constituent services have been most requested and which issues have been raised by the voters in your district this past year? Uh, unemployment, COVID, and uh, home housing. Oh, that that's sounds that. like the that sounds like everybody else. So it's, it seems like it's a, a, a familiar theme. No, it's it's brutal. I mean, honestly, I mean, uh, you know, COVID hurt a lot of things and, and opened up a lot of uh, issues that we have. And then the housing, you know, housing issue has gone gone rampant. And we we gotta you know we gotta help those. You know, I got a constituent call today that I can't help somebody that. Um, has a has a uh, person that special needs child. They're getting ready to be they're being removed from their house, and I can't help them. It's driving me absolutely bad, and it's and it's sad. But this is what's going on. Well, I, I'm so glad that you uh, were able to get in, and if you can stay on for a little bit longer. Um, uh, we might have a couple questions for you from the audience, but um, thank you so much for working so hard to get on, at least by phone. That's terrific. Um, and I want to thank, thank the other two representatives as well for your responses. Um, at this time, we might have some questions from the audience, and my colleague Rosemary Shields is going to handle the chat questions, so I'm going to turn the reins over to Rosemary. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Rep. Representative Whalen, Zaros, and Diggs. Um, a lot of observations, not necessarily questions. Uh, one has already been answered by Beth Huang about are the maps available that show possible areas of redistricting, and she has put that in the chat. So that, that's been taken care of. An observation to Ann Quirk, many people moved to the Cape after the census began in March 2020 and the election in November 2020 and voted on the Cape. Not surprising, the census shows fewer people than people who were on the rolling uh, voting rolls. Is, is that an observation that you've had or do you have anything to add to that? 
You know, thank you so much for that question. Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, <laughs> recently, I've talked to more people that have said to me, I can work from home. I'm going to sell my other house and I'm going to move into my second home in Barnstable. And they wanna know how to register to vote and they wanna know what services are available. And they've been here during COVID. So they were really voters in another district altogether. They were not voters in Barnstable at the time. Um, they probably did vote by mail, which is, uh, was a great thing this year for everyone. Um, and that's gonna continue. But I, yesterday and the day before, all, I was talking to people all day long about making their second home, their now first home in Barnstable. The problem with the census is it's, it's that period of time in January. So we've gone beyond that. And that's why I still think those numbers are skewed. Yeah, and, and that's a problem. And there's, there's really no way to resolve them because the federal data is gonna be the federal data is my understanding of that. For the next okay. 10 years, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah, we really tried getting that census correct, but okay, for the, uh, for the uh, state representatives, I have a question. What is behind the new Massachusetts law passed by the House and Senate that would have the states draw the districts first before mun municipalities can draw precinct lines? Do any of you have any insight on why that is? I see Representative Whalen with his finger up. <laughs> I, uh, I, it wasn't anything that I agreed with Rosemary, um, and I, I, I thank uh, uh, the, the, the person who wrote the question for submitting it, because it's certainly something that was uh, concerning. Um, but uh, so what this is, is it was, uh, uh, it was a bill that was filed that has not been signed into law yet. Um, it's the way that when, when a bill gets uh, uh, engrossed and enacted, it goes back and forth between the bodies twice. It, we engross it in the House, then it goes to the Senate for engrossment, then it comes back to the House for enactment, and then it goes back to the Senate for enactment. So we are at the engross period, uh, but the bill now, it's uh, House 3863. That's the bill number. It's 3863. Um, the Senate version of it is eight, uh, Senate uh, 2489. Um, so it is sitting now over in the House Committee on Bills and Third Reading. And what this would do is this would have the state draw up the districts. Uh, it reverses the order. Typically, a municipality would re-precinct, notify us of the precincts, and then we would draw districts based upon the precincting. The argument that was being made for this was that it was a time is of the essence. We have to get this information out, um, and we have to get these districts drawn right away in order to meet our constitutional requirement that it's at least one year prior to um, next year's election um, so that uh, uh, people running for state representative who have a residency requirement could meet that. Uh, I, I think that we could still get the work done without the state reversing the order. Uh, I'm just concerned that um, by the state, and, and I believe it was Secretary Galvin um, was uh, was concerned with it as well. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, there are a lot of bills to pass up there that I vote against. And there are a lot of bills that I vote in favor of that Never go, ne never succeed. So uh, that's just uh, the march of uh, uh, our representative republic going forward. So, my understanding of the bill is it's temporary just for this year because of the unusual uh, problem with the census. That's just my understanding of it. Yes. And I don't know. I don't know if Beth Huang is still here because I think Drawing Democracy has a view of that, but she's not here. I don't think so. I can't ask her. Oh, she jumped off. Darn, okay, well, but thank you, uh, Representative Whalen. Um, so the next one is, um, oh, and this might be for Ann Quirk, is how do we count the hidden homeless who especially during the uh, pandemic may not be included in our census? Also, those with post office boxes who must have census enumerators come to their door, which is impossible during the pandemic, this is especially true of the Outer Cape, who have an extremely low count due to PO boxes. Is there any commentary? That's again commentary more than anything else. But I would like for Ann Quirk or anyone else to pick that up. 
I, thank you. Thank you. I can tell you that um, the homeless, it came up in, in some of our meetings prior to the 2020 census, and they pick a day and they count the homeless on that day and that day alone. And I want to oh. say it's the very beginning of January um, because that did come up. Um, I, I don't, you know, th that's a good question and I'm not sure how many we counted, but let me say this. As a town clerk, I am required to allow a homeless person to vote. A homeless person can, they have to give me an address. They can pick zero Main Street Hyannis. They can pick, where, where do they lay their head at night? They can pick that address. They can pick, um, you know, it's, it's up to them. The problem that we have is that there's no address there really. So they can't get the mail from us. So they can't get the census from us. Right. And no one can live in a post office box. Everyone has to have a physical address to be a voter. We'll send the mail to a post office box, but you have to have a physical address to be a voter. And do you have any um, idea of the number of homeless voters that you have in Barnstable? Unfortunately, I don't because we don't have those figures yet. Okay. Thank you. So m most of the questions, oh, there's a new one, uh, you know, have been more observations than anything else. Um, let me try this other one. Giving uh, to the, all the reps, given the housing shortage and affordability crisis your constituents have raised concerns for, would you support the sealing of eviction filings so renters in crisis can avoid being blacklisted when looking for rental units? Shall I repeat that? Let me repeat it. Yes. If, given the housing shortage and affordability crisis your constituents have raised concerns for, would you support the sealing, um, sealing uh, of eviction filings so renters in crisis can avoid being blacklisted when they're looking for rental units? I see two pensive faces up there. Representative Whalen or Representative Zaros, do you want to go first or second? <laughs> I'll, I'll just offer real quick okay. that um, I would be interested in learning more about it, but I mean, just a, uh, a broad across the board ceiling of uh, eviction records. No, um, it would have to be probably more narrowed to a period of time and to um, a, a cause for the eviction because people get evicted for a lot more reasons and not being able to pay the rent. They get evicted for criminal activity, violence, for uh, maintaining a, a nuisance home that uh, disturbs their neighbors. So uh, across the board, no, I, I wouldn't support it, but I would be interested in learning more about um, uh, a narrower field that, that we could look at to protect people who have been hurt by this pandemic. Right. Representative Zaros? Uh, whoever Maggie Spade Agula is, those are two great questions. She, you know, both of those questions, great questions. I mean, for me, I would be similar to what Representative Whalen said, but, you know, um, being homeless is a horrible thing. You know, I've seen it as a police officer, you know, people living in the cranberry bogs near the hospital, uh, raising their family you know, in a, in a one room motel with no kitchen, they may not be homeless, but that's not really a home. So it's a, it's a great question. I'd have to see how it's worded and maybe we could work on that. But, you know, as an elected official, we get the other side too. We hear from uh, the uh, property owners that struggle with uh, people not, you know, paying or like Representative Whalen said, committing you know, trouble type thing. So I'd have to look at it closely, but I give credit to, to that woman for both of her questions they've raised. Thank you. Um, is Representative Diggs still on? Jean? No? Yes, he's here. Oh, okay. Representative Diggs, do you have any comment? 
I'll make I'll make you a comment. Yes, um, I definitely uh, you know, look being homeless. I mean, like I said, I just I'm taking a call right now and um, from someone that's that is homeless that has a um, uh, special needs person um, and, and living with them, and, and and it's killing me that the stuff is going on. So we definitely need to do some helping in, 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 in fixing evictions. Do I have all the answers? No, but I know that we need to you know rectify these things so that this. This does not happen because, you know, one thing that we are, we, we all bleed and we all have hearts and we have to care for one another because this is one of those times where this is, that's what's most important is caring for others instead of thinking about, oh, this, that, you know, someone being homeless and not being able to take care of their child, I think is just, you know, unacceptable for us as people. Thank you very much. Rosemary, are there any other questions? Uh, not really. I have a question. How many, what's the population for a state rep? I was wondering if Ann Cork could uh, tell me that. Uh, how, how many, what's what's the population number for each state uh, district? I think you, you told us what it was for a state Senate. I actually don't know. I'd have to turn to my reps and ask them. <laughs> Somewhere in the area of 42,000, I believe. Thank, thank you, because someone just made the observation that don't we also need to have some population numbers in addition to the towns, uh, you know, that are split between reps to know which way to consolidate, Bru and they're using Brewster, consolidate Brewster, we need to know how that will impact the adjacent towns. And it's sort of like what Beth Huang talked about, that when you start fixing a, a district one place, it's like a balloon and then you, it, it every or uh, as she said, the domino effect, it, it affects everything. Um, I was just wondering, because this came up, I've, I've been going, or members of the League of Women Voters of Cape Cod have gone to almost every hearing. Uh, and so we're looking forward to this Thursday for our hearing. But uh, one of the concerns that was brought up is that sometimes the districts have to be um, put a certain way because of where the reps live. And I was just wondering, is that a concern for any of you? That, you know, you basically, you're solid where you are, so, you know, there's not going to be a problem that way. Uh, Rosemary, I can tell you, I'm, I'm, I feel pretty solid where I am. Okay. Uh, and if uh, if they don't, I don't have a birthright to the seat. Uh, someone else would run for it, and then I would go do something else. That's the way government's supposed to work. <laughs> Representative Zaris, I'm sure that you feel the same way, right? <laughs> All right. I, to a certain extent, but I love uh, what I do. And I, I'd hate to not do it, tell you the truth. I love it. And I live in West Barnstable. I'm proud of it. And I'm proud to represent, like you mentioned, uh, Rosemary, it's somewhere between 35 and 40,000 people. Yeah. And it's pretty cool. So I would hate to uh, to not be able to do it. Right. And is, Rep Nix is... has a comment on you. Okay. Yeah, right. I feel the same as all three of them. I mean, all two of them. I mean, honestly, I just, I, we just got elected and I, I'm honored to be doing this and that's why I'm trying to do everything I can to help everybody. That's what our job is. And, um, you know, we take phone calls on Sundays. We don't care what it is, what's going on. We, we do it. That's what our job is. And, and we took an oath for that. And, uh, it's, it's out of respect and honor. So we, we have noted in all our uh, meetings with the representatives, our brunches with the representatives, how wonderfully the Cape Cod uh, group comes together. It, they, they really do, and we do appreciate that. Um, I'm done here. I'm going to give it to Suzanne. Well, if we're all done with questions, then what I would like to do is thank all of our participants, uh, Beth Wong and Quirk, uh, Debbie Dagwan, Representative Whalen, Representative Zaros, and Representative Diggs for being present, being open, and willing to handle the questions. And um, thank you so much, and we'll look forward to Thursday night. I just want to remind everyone that District 9 public hearing is scheduled for 5 o'clock on a Thursday, July 29th. And if you would like to present testimony, you need to sign up in advance. So. Suzanne, yeah. if I could just. just re sure. You're, um, you need to unmute representative.
I, I must have done good because my wife went to Kate's ice cream and got me an ice cream from Kathy and John Oman. Oh, yeah. I'm going to enjoy, I'm gonna enjoy this for all of you. Yeah, and, uh, rep, I'm very jealous, but I also, Rosemary, okay. what's these brunches? Tell me about the brunches because I just, haven't been there. Just show it out. <laughs> They're new. We're, we'll get, don't worry, we'll get in touch with you. Not right. to worry. Now, that was, that was before Zara, that was before COVID in your time. Oh, okay. <laughs> great, great job, uh, Suzanne so, and you know, Rosemary. I'm also on the redistricting committee, and I will be listening to everybody's um, testimonies because honestly, this is such a huge thing. We've, I've been on five different Zooms today for different languages. Uh, that people speak so that they can, everyone can be heard. And that's what it's all about. So we're trying to do the best for all. And, um, you know, I look forward to talking and hearing from uh, people um, on Thursday. Representative Dix, we really appreciate your participating in that committee. It's uh, really important. And um, we're looking forward to speaking with the committee and you on Thursday. Thank you. Yeah, and I and just want to thank you, Suzanne. and. Rosemary and also Jeannie uh, Morrison right. for well, working on this project. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great evening, and we'll talk to y'all later. Me too. Good night Check now. out the Olympics. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>